Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining another great event in the UK Israel Women Leading Innovation Online Series, which is organized by the British Embassy and the British Council in Israel. This time, we're focusing on empowering scientific excellence. My name is Daphna, and I work at the British Embassy, and we're here for you to facilitate partnerships and collaborations between the UK and the Israeli ecosystem. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our wonderful speakers, Professor Ruth Arnon, Professor Carol Mandel, and Professor Nili Cohen. And also to thank the presenters whom you're going to meet in the networking room later after the fireside chat. And also a very, very special thank you to the amazing working group behind this. Um, whom you're also going to meet in the different meeting rooms. So thank you to Ravit, Ella, Elinor, Liron, Julia, Elaine, Hadar, and Ariel. Um, as I've mentioned, we're going to start with a fireside chat. And then later, you're going to have the possibility to go into the intimate networking rooms uh, in three captivating topics. One is going to talk about STEM beyond education. The second one about from research to startup. And the third one is going to present the UK Israel scientific programs um, that we, the British Embassy and British Council have to offer. Um, before I'm going to hand over to the British ambassador, um, I just wanted to, to share some housekeeping instructions for today. So first of all, um, during the fireside chat, we would ask if possible for everyone uh, who is not uh, one of the speakers to keep the camera off and to stay mute so that we can have our three fascinating speakers uh, uh, have the fireside chat. And if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box. And we're planning to, if, if there's enough time, um, to get to the questions towards the end. Um, and now I would like to hand over to our British ambassador, Neil Wigan. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Daphna, and thank you to everybody who's joining us today. Um, I'm evidently uh, neither a scientist nor a woman, so I'm having a very acute case of imposter syndrome at the moment. Uh, so I will uh, be as quick as possible. Um, so first I wanted to say a huge thank you to all those in, involved in organising these events. As we all know from the Zoom events we've been doing recently, uh, this takes a great deal of work and perseverance. Uh, so I'm really glad, grateful to all the team at the Embassy that, that Daphna uh, has so ably led and put together uh, to put the uh, event together tonight. Um, as Daphna said, we've, so at the embassy, we've done, we've done over the years a number of events involving women in science and innovation. Uh, back in March 2019, we did a, a Women in Artificial Intelligence mission specifically. So in uh, May of this year, as we were in, in lockdown, we decided to set up this new programme of women leading innovation between uh, the UK and, and Israel. Uh, and that's done a series of, of pitching events, of coordination, peer-to-peer uh, -peer experience sharing, uh, and that's involved over 200, so over 400 uh, innovation professionals, entrepreneurs, uh, R&D specialists, venture capitalists, uh, and so on. Um, and we very much wanted to now uh, have this event on science, given uh, how important scientific cooperation has become uh, as really a key element of the relationship between uh, the UK and Israel and something that we, we really wanted to build on. Our plans have been a bit delayed by Corona, but it's something that we're really ambitious for, uh, for the future and really want to, to keep going uh, and absolutely see uh, events like this, women's participation as being a, a really critical part to that. Um, and we have worked really hard on, on uh, putting the gender issue, on putting women um, at the heart of our scientific cooperation and trying to make sure that we stepped up the numbers. So now across all of our programs, um, now 35%, so just over one percent, just over a third, um, are, are led by women uh, as the, the, the principal researchers or the leads um, across all of our bilateral programs. 
in our flagship Virax aging program, which is our main uh, grant program encouraging scientific cooperation between the UK and Israel. Um, now 50% of the, the researchers uh, are women. Uh, we have a, a PhD fellowship program, the growth program, where five out of seven of the PhD students are women. Um, and for the UK Israel uh, inter-university strategic cooperation program, um, of the 17 collaborations selected for funding, 38% are co-led by women. So this is a really important part of the program for us. Uh, and so I'm really pleased that we're carrying this on with, with the event that we hold this evening. Um, I'm particularly pleased uh, this evening because of the speakers who've really kindly given up their time because they've all been huge allies and friends with our work on scientific collaboration. Uh, Professor Ruth Arnon, uh, as well as sort of a, a globally famous scientist who you all know, um, and a former head of the Israel Academy, but has also been since its beginning, um, the co-chair along with Lord Winston of the UK Israel Science Council. Uh, and she's been an absolutely invaluable friend and ally um, in getting us to where we are. Uh, Nili, uh, currently head of the Israel Academy, again, has been a huge friend, a real advocate of stepping things up, uh, and on a personal basis, somebody I've really enjoyed working with uh, and have really enjoyed every time we've got together. Um, and Carol, as well as being a, a professor of extragalactic astronomy, but also head is the chief scientific advisor for the Foreign Office, uh, oversees the science and innovation team that we have here at the embassy. Uh, and is our huge advocate in London for pushing forward UK-Israel scientific collaboration. So I'm really pleased that we've got people who are not just uh, really eminent scientists in their own right, um, but also have been huge friends and allies to us. Uh, so I'm extremely grateful to them. Uh, and now with a great pleasure, I, I hand over to, to Daphna uh, to lead us through, through the fireside chat with them, which I'm really looking forward to. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Neil. Um, so now I'm going to start um, the fireside chat. Um, thank you all for joining and uh, enjoy. <laughs> so for centuries, women have made significant contribution to the field of science. They discovered life-saving remedies, devised world altering inventions and produced far reaching research. There is a well-known gender disparity in academia and the science sector in general. Despite the rise in numbers of women in science, there are still significant challenges in specific fields such as STEM, in higher positions and in tech transfers. While the majority of female academics are at career entry level, there is much lower representation of women in higher positions. We still have a long way to go until women feel encouraged to study STEM, empowered to work and succeed and are equally represented at the leadership level across the industry. With this, UK Israel le Women Leading Innovation, Empowering Scientific Excellence, we're aiming to foster a network that empowers women in the science sector. I'd like to invite our speakers who will share their unique experiences and life lessons is leading women in the male dominated science sector, along with tips for women who are in the early stage of their careers. First, I'll start with Professor Ruth Arnon, who is a world renowned Weizmann Institute biochemist and co-creator of multiple sclerosis drug, Copaxone. In 2010, you became the first female president of the Israel Academy of Science and Humanities. And we also have the current president with us. Recently, you've been awarded the R. Cried Mamonides Award for Lifetime Achievement in Science, Leadership and Menschlichkeit in February 2020. In addition to the roles at the Weizmann Institute and the Israel Academy, you've served in many senior national international positions. One, which Neil already mentioned, which is very close to us, is co-chairing our UK Israel Science Council. So Ruth, I would like to start if you could maybe please share some of the challenges you faced in how you got to where you are today and share advice on how you overcame them. Well, I think that the, the, first of all, I faced the challenges that every scientist shares uh, when he or she 
start uh, decides to uh, to become a scientist uh, it's first of all the education uh, and a, a very important stage in the education is after graduating and receiving my phd degree the decision to go and do a postdoctoral uh, studies abroad i mention it because for women it's not so easy at that time i was married i had a i had a child uh, my husband had a position and we had to make a decision and it was not an easy decision to uh, whether to go abroad or to look for a position here in israel as a scientist after finishing my P after graduating my phd and uh, we decided to take this step because i am convinced until today that this is an essential step for every everyone who be, wants to become a scientist an israeli who wants to become to, to become a scientist in the academia to go abroad you can do postdoctoral uh, you know education or whatever you call it in another university in israel but it's not the same the exposure abroad is extremely important and at that stage what was important i found is the um, cooperation i would say uh, in the family because my husband has also to make a decision he had to leave his job but he decided that he will use this time to do a phd he was an engineer and uh, working in a government office but he decided that he in the united states and specialized and he specialized he was a chemical engineer specialized in polymer and this was i mean uh, looking back this was a very important stage for him as well because he gained an expertise that was unique in israel and he then uh, uh, was a very effective in studying uh, polymeric materials for the uh, aircraft industry and uh, so i mentioned this because this is a step that every young scientist in the beginning of a career has to make and it is uh, not always easy for women especially for women with family but i think that it is essential and i recommend it for everyone who who contemplates an academic career Thank you very much, Ruth. I will now continue with Carol. Um, so unequal access to education, technologies and leadership positions have steered countless bright female minds away from STEM careers. Research conducted by the Royal Academy of Engineering has found that just 12% of engineers in the UK are women and they earn around 11% less than their male counterpart counterparts on average. Research from McKinsey Global Institute estimates that women have suffered more than half of total job losses from the current crisis. So the importance of empowering women to join the science STEM workforce is undeniable. Professor Carol Mundell, you were appointed the Chief Scientific Advisor at the FCDO in October 2018, and you were the first woman to hold that position. As Neil has mentioned, you're professor of extragalactic astronomy, head of astrophysics at the University of Bath, and a fellow of the Institute of Physics. You're involved with several campaigns to improve representation of women in astronomy. And in 2016, you won the Woman of the Year Award at the FDM Every Woman in Technology Awards. So I would like to ask you if you could please share your insights on women in STEM and the benefits of international collaboration and working together from the UK side. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a great pleasure to, to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity. And I think particularly networks are important. I've always been an international scientist. My collaborators are around the world, men and women. Um, and like Ruth, I also had a period of postdoctoral research abroad. So I worked in the United States and that was a really exciting opportunity to work in a very different science system. And I brought much of the learning as a young scientist there back to my research positions in the UK. And it also raised my profile, it increased my international network 
networks. Many of the, the friends and colleagues that I made when I was in the United States were from countries around the world themselves. And we've remained good friends and colleagues uh, since as we've become more senior scientists and industrialists. And you're absolutely right to, to note the, the lack of senior women representation, particularly in the physical sciences and, and engineering. I should also say, I think in the life sciences and the biology sciences, um, particularly in the UK, um, we see many young women coming in undergraduate level, sometimes almost 90% women. And again, you see that very precipitous drop off in this at the senior levels. So um, I think, you know, in physics, we have a challenge that we don't have that big pool of women coming in. The Institute of Physics did a study recently, and they looked at the sort of stubborn gender bias statistics in terms of undergraduate women choosing physics courses, around about 20% stuck for about the last 20 years, despite lots of initiatives that the IOP have tried to run. And they look to try to understand what the challenge was there. One of the challenges is actually parents' perceptions of the field. And in fact, when we look at all the, the press coverage that traditionally goes around things like Nobel Prizes, a physicist to most people is an older white man. And that's a real barrier. So if you don't see someone who looks like you at senior levels, you don't necessarily automatically think that there's a career path for you there. And I was very fortunate to be at the Nobel Awards when and Professor Donna Strickland won the Nobel Prize in physics and also Professor Francis Arnold did in chemistry. And they both gave incredibly inspiring speeches at the dinner. I think both of them are available online. And I think Professor Strickland really made the point in many of her interviews that she's a physicist. She's not a woman physicist, she's a physicist. And this is what a physicist looks like. And so I think that's really important. We have to have that senior representation. And I think in order to, to do that, and that's why I think the conversation today is so exciting, is to have the senior women who are in these roles for us to network and connect together. Because maybe in our own countries, there aren't enough of us. In our field, we might be the only one. It's wonderful to be the first woman who dot dot dot. We have real progress when we're the second or the third or it's no longer notable. So many of us are pioneering and we're actually following in the footsteps of other women who have been, you know, just single leaders in their field who've stood out. I think in my, my own field, Professor and Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, an absolute trailblazer. But what a very lonely position uh, to, to blaze that trail. And she's, you know, she's supported and mentored very quietly in the background, you know, generations of women. So connecting across women's generations is also important so we can share that learning back and help pull one another along and make sure that we, we remove some of those barriers. And I think from my, my foreign office perspective, I think also what's important is that government really makes a change. And we heard Neil speak very eloquently there about um, the wonderful initiatives that you're, you're leading there in the embassy. And I think it's important to be very strategic and tactical as well. We can encourage women, we can inspire women, and women want to come through and do science and technology and engineering, but we actually also have to remove the barriers and be very practical about that. And one of the initiatives that I think struck me most was that one of our innovation agencies um, launched a, the Women in Innovation um, scheme. And this was launched in June 2016 to directly address underrepresentation of women uh, engaging with Innovate UK, which is one of our funding bodies. Um, and so this is quite different to academics engaging with, with the grant system. This is really from the, the commercial and industrial side. And to actually get more women who have brilliant ideas innovating in UK businesses and to really to boost the UK economy, because we all went out when we have diverse teams. And since they started that initiative, the number of women leading applications for commercial grants to Innovate UK has increased by 70%. So there's now more than 1,700 women who've joined the Women in Innovation community. And that's, that's a huge boost to that network. Suddenly you're you're not the only one in the room. Suddenly you're not trying to make your voice land. You're actually sharing best practice. And I think that was when I won the, the Innovation Award in 2016. That was absolutely overwhelming. You know, there were 600 brilliantly talented women in that, that, that award ceremony, in that dinner. Sadly, we can't do in the current coronavirus um, epidemic. But, you know, from across the whole world, across all sectors, small, medium enterprises, big corporations. And I was there as an academic. So it was humbling from the perspective of winning that award and having the innovation and the work that I did recognized. Um, and just to stand up and in front of that, that eminent audience, full of energy, full of ideas and really, you know, really doing phenomenally important things across all sorts of areas of innovation and improving people's lives and driving, you know, innovation in our countries, improving our country's prosperity and really, you know, genuinely impacting women's lives across the world. So the, the talent pool is out there and actually now we have the seniority in different sectors, but we have to connect. And I think the only way we can get critical mass to do that is by doing it internationally. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Carol. And I would like also to add that the, the innovation agencies, the initiative that you have mentioned is actually uh, something that Neil has mentioned. Um, we work very closely with Innovate UK and we had the mission, uh, the Women in AI, which was the second mission. The first one was Boston and the second one was to Israel. And this network is still flourishing and still um, a great initiative. Um, and, Fantastic and stuff. Really nice to have. Um, okay, and now I would like to introduce um, Professor Nili Cohen. So, um, you are the president of the Israel Academy of Science and Humanities. You're succeeding professor after Ruth Arnon. Um, you're an Israeli professor and legal expert, a recipient of the Israel Prize in Law. And you've served as vice rector and subsequently as rector of Tel Aviv University. So I would like to hear from you. I'm actually gonna ask you two questions, if that's okay. Um, I would like to hear from you if you could please share your insights in gender equity at the academia. And the second question that I had in mind after hearing um, uh, about the lack of women in STEM, I wanted to, to ask about, there's, um, there's an initiative from the Young, Young Academy, uh, the first women in science, which seeks to promote women in STEM fields with schools throughout Israel. So how will the school of tomorrow help young girls to become STEM specialists? Please. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and thank you for the opportunity to have this uh, wonderful meeting and to meet uh, Carol, the first time I meet her, and Ruth, which is my, uh, who is my dearest uh, friend. And actually, as you mentioned, she paved my presidency. And she was the first female president of the academy and she made it very easy for me. Uh, so um, you're asking about equity in academia or equality in academia. And the fact that we gather here reflects that the problem is still with us. Uh, yet my personal experience, both uh, experience, both personally and institutionally, uh, is kind of a source of encouragement because I look at the figures and when I was rector of Tel Aviv University, uh, the percentage of full professors at the university was less than 10%, 7%. It was a little bit more than 20 years ago. Now, nowadays, it's around 20. So I'm not saying it's enough, but we are uh, making a step forward. Now, we see more women in uh, leadership positions um, uh, due to legal uh, change, societal awareness, and we see uh, women in um, banks, leading banks, um, ministers in government, more members of parliament, uh, more um, head of departments in hospitals, and also in academia. That's not enough. I regard myself lucky. And uh, when I ask myself what were the keys to my success, I can say that there were endless commitment, awareness to equality and preparedness to fight for it, a wish to accomplish and support. And the support was given from my parents who were the babysitters of my children. And actually, um, in the year uh, 77 uh, or 8, when I got my doctorate, I said that I had two births, two children and a doctorate. And I could do it because of my parents. And apart for, uh, from my parents, uh, I had a wonderful husband. Um, he passed away several years ago, unfortunately. Uh, but he was the my greatest supporter. He, he was a lawyer, practicing lawyer, and he had enough self-confidence not to be afraid uh, of my success. So he went together with me 
to my postdoctorate at the University of Pennsylvania. And when we were sitting together, the whole bunch of postdoctorates, we were asked what we were doing by the Israeli Council in Philadelphia. And the Israeli Council in Philadelphia, of course, approached my husband because he was sure he was the postdoctorate. And my husband answered, well, I'm a husband, I, I'm, I'm the, the husband of my wife. I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of the home and the children and she is the postdoctorate. So difficulties were and are still present. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, before going to the postdoctorate, uh, I applied uh, for a scholarship by foundation and uh, I was asked by the committee, all male, what would my husband do in the United States? Why am I dragging my husband for my postdoctorate? Well, uh, probably I didn't have a good uh, response, so I did not get the scholarship. And then several years after that, when I ran for uh, the position of rector of uh, Tel Aviv University, I was asked, well, it was only one uh, full professor at the university. Can a woman serve as a rector? He was a physician. And then uh, several years later, uh, as a rector, there was a delegation to China of university rectors, and I was supposed to serve as head of the delegation. And one administrator asked me, would Chinese accept a woman as a head of the delegation? And then I had a very, very good response because our ambassador in China was a woman, Oran Amir. So if uh, the Chinese accepted a woman as an ambassador, they would definitely accept a woman as a head of the rector's delegation. So we had an uphill battle. We have a long battle still to fight, but I think we are improving. Now you refer to the Young Academy and the School of Tomorrow. Uh, the Young Academy, is a wonderful idea implemented during Ruthie's uh, tenure. And the idea is to have young members who are excellent scientifically, but uh, are committed also to society and to social goals in academia. So with regard to their um, program uh, to visit a high school, I believe in developing awareness and in the impact of role models, as uh, Carol uh, mentioned. Uh, when we mention uh, names such as Ada Yonat and Ruth Arnon and many other successful scientists, I'm sure that we can convince a female high school students that they can. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Hey, Daphna, may I say something? Sure, yes. I'd like to add something. I think that uh, what Nili said is very important. And what is important also is the commitment that one is ready to undertake. Uh, I, I, from early stages in my career, in addition to working in the lab and trying to achieve as much as, as much as possible in the lab, I also was involved in the international activity in immunology. I, I, I was elected the president of EFIS, which is the European Federation of Immunological Society. I was also the secretary general of the International Union of Immunological Societies. And also there was a federation of, of academies in Asia, the ASA, which is an association of academies of scientists in Asia. And I acted as a president of this assembly because Nili mentioned China and so uh, even in Asia. 
and this is because of commitment that one I was willing to uh, undertake and uh, because I was willing to undertake this commitment, I was elected to these positions, and this also contributed to some recognition, both in Israel and abroad. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, I would like to also maybe ask, um, I will start with uh, Carol, but maybe um, Nili and Ruth, you, you can also add to this. Um, so now with the current situation, do you think that there are potential positive changes that we can see in today's reality and how we can integrate the positive new norms to post COVID reality? Yeah, I do. And I think I've seen um, certainly working through um, SAGE, which is our science advice gov to government um, in emergencies, um, you know, lots of, I mean, a huge amount of talent working through on this COVID crisis and the importance of those international collaborations. I've also heard lots of uh, research reports saying that women and minority ethnic groups will be disproportionately and are being disproportionately impacted. It depends which country you're in as to how that plays out. But again, going back to the stereotypes that women are the child carers, they have children at home if, a, if your region or your country is in lockdown. So you're seeing lots of those biases coming through. I think gathering the data is important so we actually have the evidence and we can really confront what we're seeing with with real uh, real fact we do see um potentially a drop certainly in, in physics and astrophysics in the number of papers that are being submitted um, over these last months uh, by women and so that suggests that they're taking on a disproportionate um, homemaking role or other other constraints in their lives that they're, they're unable for whatever reason to um, to contribute in the research side but I think it also means that we have to look at how we measure success and I've had lots of conversations with some of my, my male academic colleagues around what productivity is productivity isn't just producing lots of papers it's actually thinking about what impact they will have and i think the coronavirus you know crisis has really focused people's minds on how do we contribute to society there always is also a very harsh light um, being shone on inequality in each of our communities but one of the positives that I've seen is that I think is probably you know, different to any other past pandemic is this ability to digitally connect. And I was just, just saying before we came on the call, I found this incredibly empowering myself and it's made the world smaller and friendlier. I've been, it's much, much easier to connect with people. Um, even if it's a difficult line, even if one, as I had shortly uh, before I came on the call, a power outage, but you know there's somebody on the other end of the line. The other thing that I've seen in very practical terms is just the use of that technology. So in a panel discussion, often when it is, one is in a room, one is a minority, um, you might want to try to raise your voice, but there'll be certain physical power dynamics in the room. You know, often the, the tall male presence assumed to be the, the leader in the room. Um, um, and I think, you know, women have to work harder sometimes in those rooms to make their voices heard. And actually in this digital environment, I've seen these parallel conversations, people who would not have raised their voices normally, being able to put things in the chat, being able to raise their points and a very, very leveling um, sense of the, these digital environments when people can't shout over one another because the whole signal cuts out. So it's been really interesting watching that and asking senior women colleagues, how have they found this period? Does their personal lived experience really match up with the a lot of the rhetoric we're hearing about being women being disproportionately impacted and it's been quite mixed some have said well yeah i am having to pick up some of these family duties but actually it's given me um, more flexibility in how i connect with my children or how i'm involved in their education you know my partner's picking up more of that we're sharing more of it or i can be more flexible because i don't have to travel great distances or commute i can go straight into you know the back bedroom and do a call. Uh, some haven't found it so positive, some have found that it's had an impact on their personal identity and how they feel they split home from work. But I think that's also impacting the men as well. So the positive is it's opening up that conversation for men and women to be able to say, how do we live our lives? How do we integrate work with life? And how do we separate those barriers? And actually within academia, uh, many of us have more flexibility than people do in other professions. I'm very, very fortunate to be able to work internationally 
traditionally digitally in this way and I think that that's a great privilege um, not something that everybody has there is a digital divide as well there is a digital inequality and so and now looking at different kinds of inequality and how we pull those through and level up I think is also really important as we come out of this crisis and we look at things like health inequality socioeconomic impact and how that again often disproportionately impacts at the intersection between race and gender and other and other characteristics so again we have we have a lot to share I think from the experiences we've had um, of being minorities in our professions um, and being able to, to, to again push on those those doors of inequality uh, I would like to uh, point to another angle um, I think that uh, during this time in the last uh, eight nine months at the Weizmann Institute there are uh, 60 or more than 60 scientists in the Institute started to work on projects that are related to the coronavirus from various points of view, from understanding the structure, from trying to look for better way for vaccination, etc. But 60, over 60 new projects in the Institute by scientists of the Institute that are related to the COVID-19. And I think that uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, to me, this is a very, uh, I would say, special angle because scientists usually go within the narrow uh, path of their of their research project and don't go, don't want to go neither right or or left. But here, people felt that they that they have to be mobilized in order to uh, find a solution to this issue that is paralyzing us all. Absolutely, a huge mobilizing if, factor. If I may add, I think that uh, from the point of view of young women researchers, uh, this pandemic, I'm not sure, uh, was very beneficial because, well, I have in my family um, a daughter-in-law who is a doctor and she's a scientist. She had to take care of the kids during the lockdown. Um, there were uh, too many constraints to enable her to focus on her scientific work. And I think that uh, many other young women researchers felt the same. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to maybe follow up uh, on, on what you've just said. Would you maybe have uh, any advice for the for the young female academics who are contemplating between family life and career, but also with the with the pandemic? We've heard a bit already, but maybe you would have some some advice that you would like to share. You ask me. Um, I ask you, yeah. but I'm also happy to hear from Ruth and Carol. <laughs> yeah. The only advice that uh, I can give is think of what you love to do best and then focus on it and thrive to it and don't think yourself don't think of yourself as a woman think of yourself as a scientist and go ahead and uh, the really the, the gender should not play a role we see today and i look I look at the Weizmann Institute, I look also at other universities in Israel and abroad, and we are very lucky. The Nobel Prize this year was in, in medicine was given to two women. So this is a very good, uh, I'd say good omen uh, to, to all of us. Don't think yourself, don't think of the gender. Think of yourself as a scientist. Think of what excites you the most and go for it. And I, I would agree completely. I mean, what I've seen in uh, in physics is that because women are a minority, they often take on the extra care roles within their academic departments as well as in their families. And I think, you know, you find what you love, you know, as Ruth says, that's what lights your fire, that's what gets you up in the morning. And then be quite ruthless, actually, in terms of what you say yes to and what you say no to. Yes, 
be a good colleague, be a good citizen, um, but actually don't feel you have to disproportionately take those extra um, housekeeping duties on for your, your department, for example. And I think also in terms of, you know, that family balance, sometimes that's a real opportunity to have that conversation as a family about what you want in your career and in your life, how that balances. I mean, you know, sim similar to, to Ruth and Neely, I have, you know, a support, really supportive husband and I'm really lucky to have that. And we lived apart when I was a young researcher and we made that strategic decision that he would live in the UK, I would do my research in the US and we had the long view on that. And I see many young academics, men and women, who believe because we portray that back to them that there is a single path to take to be a successful academic and i don't think that's true i think if you do what you love and you're driven by that you'll find all sorts of different paths yep. there isn't the, i want to grow up to be a professor or i have to have had these eminent postdocs and i have to have this many papers find what what you love make it work with your family because after this crisis your family is still going to be your family <laughs> the pressures will still be there and then find that path through and you know find what a good life for you looks like and have that contract with your family and then have that flexibility to take on opportunities. I mean, you know, I became the chief scientific advisor at the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. I was not planning to do that in my career. At no point did I ever say, I'm going to grow up to be a chief scientific advisor. Opportunities come along. You make those opportunities by doing the right thing, doing what you love, being respectful to people around you, working with good people. Work with people who give you energy that at the end of a conversation or the end of a day or the end of of a project you're thinking yes you know I could work for another 25 hours today rather than coming away thinking I've given my energy and it's gone from me so you know it should add up to something positive and I think all of the you know the eminent scientists that we've mentioned today and you know on our call today you know we've had success because we found good people to work with and then the the, the energy is almost infinite um, and we also know the relationships that sap our energy so be ruthless about who you connect with I agree with every word I agree with the words of both of you. <laughs> um, before I go to the next question, I just wanted to see if there's maybe some questions in the audience. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat box and then we're happy to get them answered. Um, in the meantime, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue with another question for Nili. Um, so we were talking about um, also the, the opportunities that there are with, uh, with uh, the current crisis and that the networking or collaborating is getting much easier, which you can see even through this Women Leading Innovation uh, Initiative and, and, and those kind of events that we're putting online. Um, so to Nili, I was thinking even the in February 2020, this was still when when flying was possible. The president a minute, of the, a minute before the pandemic. A minute. Yes, really. <laughs> uh, the president of the Royal Society was able to visit and 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 you signed and renewed an agreement to ensure an additional five years of cooperative scientific activities. So could you maybe share, you know, what, what can be done since then, you know, to in, in bilateral relationships in, in these times? Well, thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, question. Uh, actually, Ruth made it happen six years ago. She, she was the, the one uh, to sign a historic agreement uh, with, the, with the Royal Society and it's flourishing. And uh, I was very happy uh, to host the president of the Royal Society, Nobel laureate, uh, Sir Venki Ramakrishnan, uh, and uh, to sign the, on the renewal of this agreement. I saw uh, some minutes earlier, Julie Maxton, and uh, Julie Maxton is really the spirit behind the the agreement she visited Israel and she just uh, wrote to me that she had to leave this meeting because she had another meeting and she wished she would have been now in Israel. So um, all my gratitude to Julie and to, uh, to the people, to the wonderful people uh, at the Royal Society. Now uh, we are discussing the possibility 
uh, to have an online conference on pharma pharmacology and immunization, we are still discussing the possibility. But really, a minute before the pandemic bro broke out, we had a fantastic scientific conference on structural biology with uh, Venki and Adayonat and Roger uh, Kornberg and the uh, Nobel laureate uh, Anderson. And uh, it was so vivid and so intellectually and scientifically stimulating uh, that I think it was one of the best uh, conferences we, we've ever had at, at, uh, at the Academy. And I look forward to personal meetings because we are working on substitutes, but I, I don't think that there is a real substitute to a personal meeting. And now I would like to refer to, to share with you a personal experience uh, as I'm not part of the STEM circle, but as a law researcher, I'm proud to tell you uh, that my scientific uh, ties with the UK enriched me a lot. Uh, Israel was part of the common law as part of the British mandate. And for us, ties with the UK are of the utmost uh, importance. And I'm personally part of the Society of uh, uh, Legal Scholars, the UK Legal Scholars. Uh, and I participate almost every year in, in, a, in a conference dedicated to different fields of law. I co-edited the book with Ewan McKendrick, an eminent legal scholar at Oxford. Uh, I took part um, in UK projects on contracts and restitution and was happy to send my warmest wishes to Andrew Barrows, the new justice uh, at the UK Supreme Court, a former professor at Oxford, whom I know very, very well. So I, I agree, I fully agree with both Carol and Ruth that um, forging scientific foreign relationship is really crucial. And this meeting is uh, another occasion of enabling us to forge uh, such a relation. And uh, if I may sum up a small advice to, to all the participants, I would like to borrow from a philanthropist. Uh, his name is Marcel Adams, and he supports the STEM doctorate program at the academy. He passed away a few months ago at the age of 100 years, and he uh, formulated some principles for success knowledge, priorities, perseverance, passion, innovation, ethics. If you have all this with the sense and awareness of equality and with emotional and practical support from family, you'll be able to make it. So I wish lots of success to you all and thank you so much. We don't hear you. Okay. Yeah, I just saw. Thank you. <laughs> Part of being online. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm I'm conscious of time. Before I wrap up, I wanted to ask if you wanna if yeah. you want to say yeah, something. I want to say something about Virax. Yes. Uh, uh, we are now in the second program of Virax. Virax was established. I think it was the it was mainly the initiative of. Uh, uh, Matthew Gould, the previous ambassador, uh, British ambassador, and I think that it is a very successful uh, program. Uh, the first uh, program was on the subject of regenerative medicine, which is, a, and I remember that the establishment of the program was on the premises of the Israel Academy of Sciences. That was the meeting uh, in which it was decided. And when this program was finished, 
uh, we, we started, we launched the second one, which is on healthy aging, that I think that is extremely uh, important issue uh, nowadays when we are facing the, the whole phenomenon of uh, aging population, the, uh, the, the, the increase in, in longevity, which is a very welcome effect, but we need to have more uh, research on, on healthy aging. And I'm glad to say that out of the six projects that were selected, half are by women. So we keep our finger crossed that this, this will continue. This trend will continue. We have two of these women with us. They're here participating. And uh, whoever is going to the third room on, on the UK uh, Israel scientific programs is going to hear from them on, on being a Birex uh, grantee. Excellent. I wish everybody a success. And Daphne, if I just may, may, may conclude, I think what's really struck me about this, this conversation now is networking is, is really important, building up those, those people to people relationships. But what's even more important is cementing those with concrete initiatives. And what's really struck me is Ruth's founding of these incredible initiatives, Neely's carrying them on. So that continuity, you know, we need to have that stability, almost that infrastructure that's hidden that I, I guess our, our male counterparts have had for, for generations and millennia. But those initiatives are what we can then embed our networks through and really enable our women to to thrive in their fields and become you know the the new shapers of how they want to take the, their fields forward and actually you know create those new initiatives and keep them going so just thank you for the opportunity to connect today and i'm hoping i, I will be able to join um, a couple of the breakout rooms for a little while before i have to leave thank you and please come come and visit us when absolutely as soon as we get the world opened you're at top of my list it will be wonderful to as you say person to person this is wonderful online but there's just a little bit of something extra missing so thank you definitely so thank you very much um this fireside chat is another testimony of how important the role for such a women's network um can do and will play in promoting women leading innovation I want to thank you, our wonderful speakers. I want to thank Ruth, Carol, and Neely. It was really inspiring. And uh, we, I think I'm not the only one that feels that we could go on and on and on with this, uh, with this chat. Um, and uh, we hope that also our audience, by hearing this, you, the inspiring leading women, um, this is going to, the network is going to be growing. And, and we'll continue the discussions in the networking rooms now. And also hopefully it will continue beyond this session. Um, so I'm gonna finish the fireside chat now. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Daphna. Thank you, Daphna. And a good evening to you all. And lots of success to you all. Thank you, goodbye. And thank you, Daphna, Bye. for your wonderful chairing. Bye.